hope you're enjoying this series about surrender. We talked a few weeks ago about uh, surrendering for blessings, and that's truly how the blessings are going to come as we surrender to Him and His will for our life. We talked uh, after that about surrendering your time, surrendering your time, walking with Him. And then we talked about surrendering your trust, trusting in Him. And so today I want to talk to you about surrender your thinking. Surrender your thinking. It's going to be more of a thinking type message. I'm sure I'll end up preaching, but I'm going to be more, uh, I think, just teaching. Uh, but if you're there, Proverbs chapter 3, would you stand with me, please? Proverbs chapter 3, I'll read verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. And the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Boy, that's a surrender of thinking right there, isn't it? Then it says, and lean not onto thine own understanding. That is definitely a surrender of thinking. In all thy ways acknowledge him. That's definitely surrendering your thinking. And he shall direct thy paths. And that's certainly a blessing. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Notice here, it shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. I like how God always puts a command in there and then he puts a promise attached to it. And if you'll just do what he's commanding you to do, you'll get that promise. You can claim that promise. And that promise is always something good. Have you noticed that? It's never anything bad or detrimental to you. And if you would just do what he tells you to do, then you can have something good as a result of it. That's why I'll say again and again and again, you've got to surrender for blessings. Surrender for blessings. Let's pray today. Father, we love you. Thank you for the word of God. Pray you bless these thoughts as we look at them today. Help us to surrender our thinking to you. Have the mind of Christ. Work on us today like only the Holy Spirit can. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. When we talk about surrendering your thinking to God, we're really saying, allow God to control your mind. Allow God to control your mind. Have you ever noticed if you get involved in something deeply, that you really can't shake that thing for a while. Say you watch a good movie and it's heart-wrenching and it's tear-jerking and it's emotional. And you, you sort of, you almost live out that movie for a while afterwards. You treat people differently maybe than you would normally. Uh, but, that, but you were immersed in something really life-changing. That's kind of where we're getting at with these, these uh messages on surrender and surrendering our time and our trust and and uh, in this in this thought surrendering our thinking you know critics of christianity many times accuse christians of having all the answers i mean we can't help but hide behind this book amen but many times those same critics they seem to have answers for questions that people aren't even asking trying to like divert the subject and divert our thinking. We see that a lot in politics today. Kind of reminds me of that drunk guy that was stumbling down a road and he came by a river and the preacher was baptizing somebody. The drunk came right up to the edge of the river and uh, the preacher saw him and he yelled out to the man. He said, hey, sir, are you, are you ready to find Jesus? And the man sort of hiccuped, and, and he said, well, sure. And so the drunk man went down into the river, and the preacher baptized him. And when he came up out of the water, the preacher said to him, did you find Jesus? And the man said, no. And so the preacher was kind of shocked, and so he dunked him on, under the water again, and uh, he lifted him up, and, and he said, did you find Jesus? And the man was a bit more sober now from the cold water in the river. 
But he still looked at him and he said, no, I didn't. And so the preacher was frustrated and so he grabbed him again and he shoved him under the water harder this time. And uh, he held him under there for a good 30 seconds until he, until he started kicking and flailing around. And then he led him back up. And he said, I'll ask you one last time, did you find Jesus? And the drunk man just looked at him. He said, I'll ask you a question. Are you sure this is where Jesus fell in? <laughs> we got to watch our terminology, I think. You start asking people, did you find Jesus? And people start wondering, was Jesus lost? I think we've got to think about what we say we believe. Think about the way we speak. Think about the way we communicate the gospel. I mean, the critics have all kinds of ammunition because there's some really bizarre Christians out there. Have you noticed? I mean, it was like 20 years ago now, I think, but there was a grilled cheese sandwich on sale on eBay. Went for $28,000 in the end, and it had an image of the Virgin Mary on it. And people just went crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> the hoax, ladies and gentlemen, is a grilled cheese sandwich. you got to kind of wonder, what a... What a People think of Christians when they think Christians are falling for stuff like that. Is that how Christians think? You know, not long ago there was another uh, story of uh, some M&Ms that got melted, I guess, in the candy dispenser and came out. And one of the M&Ms apparently had a, an image of Jesus with a crown on his head. And went for $3,100 on eBay before it got taken off and sold privately to somebody. Hey, what do you believe? What moves you? Is it a movie that moves you? Is it your parents' Christianity, what they say you should believe? Is that what you think is right? Have you ever surrendered your thinking? To have what would be called a biblical world view. I'm going to ask you eight questions this morning. And you just you can answer them out loud if you want, just yes or no, or you can just answer them quietly. But I want you to take note to yourself whether you say yes or whether you say no to these questions. And I think these questions will help you determine what do you believe. And just answer honestly to yourself as to what you actually believe on these eight questions. First question is, do absolute moral truths exist? I mean, is there an absolute right? Is there an absolute wrong? Do absolute moral truths exist? Second question, is absolute truth defined by the Bible? Or is it defined somewhere else? I mean, only you can answer that for yourself. I've got my own answer. Third question. Did Jesus Christ live a sinless life? Did he actually live a sinless life? You know you're not capable of it. I know I'm not capable of it. But did he? Fourth question. Is God... The all-powerful creator of the universe. And does he still rule today? It's a bit of meaning in that question. I'll explain it a bit later. But what do you believe about that? Fifth question. Is salvation a gift from God that cannot be earned? In other words, there's nothing you can do to get it. Number five. Number six. Is Satan real? Is Satan real? Number seven. Does a Christian 
actually have the responsibility to share his or her faith in Christ? Do you believe that? Or do you not believe that? And the eighth question, is the Bible accurate in all of its teachings? Now, if you answered yes to all eight questions, you would have what would be called a biblical world view. Now, if you answered no to one or more of the questions, you're not a bad person. I'm glad that you're here. Amen? And if you answered no to all the questions, again, I'm glad that you're here. But I want us to think today, what do we actually believe? And I want to ask us three questions to sort of hone in on what exactly do you believe? What exactly do I believe? And the first question today is, what's a world view anyway? Well, what is a world view? Now there's a poll done by Barna Research where they interviewed thousands of Christians in America about their religious beliefs. And they asked them the exact same eight questions that I just asked you. The results of that survey were published in a book by George Barna called Think Like Jesus. Can I say today, whether you know it or not, you have a worldview. Everyone does. Here's the definition of a worldview. A worldview is the way you look at the big picture of life. It's how you view it. George, George Barna himself, he defined it this way. He said, a mental and spiritual lens through which you view reality. That's what a worldview is. It's the mental and spiritual lens through which you view reality, everything that's happening around you. That's what your worldview is. And can I say, everything in life is filtered through your lens of beliefs what you believe. And so when we say you have a biblical worldview, that is, you answer yes to all eight of those questions, then you have certain morals based on that. You make personal decisions that are different than somebody who doesn't have a biblical worldview, all because you believe all eight of those things that we just lined up here. Chuck Colson said, my personal beliefs direct my decisions and actions. You can't help but make decisions based on what you think is right. I think that's why it's so important that America not get away from the Bible. I think that's why it's so important that families have family devotions. And the parents lift up the importance of the Word of God in front of their children. And they give them biblical answers to their real-life questions as they grow up. Because you are shaping their beliefs, which is shaping the way that they are going to view the world as they get out and they start making decisions. A biblical worldview filters everything through it. I can't look at the news and not have certain opinions, say, on the election of 2020. Yep. Because my biblical worldview, it, it warps it. It skews the, maybe the thoughts that somebody else would have. My biblical worldview impresses itself. The war in Gaza right now, where the, the nation of Israel is continuing to defend itself against the terrorists of Hamas and Hezbollah. Um, 
I, I view that whole thing, I have an opinion, and it's based on my biblical worldview, and so do you. So that's the first question. Now you know exactly what a worldview is. Second question for us today is, do many Americans have a biblical worldview? Can I just say, if you choose to be a thinking Christian, you're going to be in the minority. Yes. Right. Welcome to reality there. Right. If you choose to have a biblical worldview and to be a thinking Christian and look at it all and try to filter it all through, thus saith the Lord, you are going to be in the minority. In George Barna's study, he found out by interviewing, like I said, thousands of people that only 4% of Americans that were interviewed held a biblical world view. Only 4% of the people said yes to all eight questions. Here's another kicker. Only 7% that claim to be born again Christians hold a biblical worldview. Now they weren't asked directly, are you a born again Christian? But they were asked in a roundabout way what their faith was and if it was construed that they placed their faith in Jesus Christ to save them, that they were a born again Christian too. And only 7% of those people said yes to all eight questions. Of adults who attended college, only 6% held a biblical worldview. We're in a minority. Those who never attended college, only 2% hold a biblical worldview. And that makes sense. You know, you think about the people maybe that are in, in less affluent areas, and they maybe haven't gone to college, and they don't have... And they, they many times tend to make um, more immoral decisions, could I say. Why? Because they, again, your biblical worldview affects your judgments, yeah. the choices that you make. Only 51% of Protestant pa pastors answered yes to all eight questions. Oh, Only half. Of Protestant pastors, we put ourselves in that group. I could go on and define that further, but only half of them answered yes. It could be the part of the problems from the pulpit. The highest percentage, thankfully, was among Baptists. Seventy-one percent held to that biblical worldview. The lowest was among United Methodist pastors. They came in at 27% of that number. The lowest percent of people in America holding a biblical worldview are in all six New England states and in Louisiana. That's where they're concentrated. Not California, believe it or not. The two states with the highest percentage Texas Amen. and North Carolina. I don't have the percentage. They have the highest percentage. So what you believe about the Bible determines what you believe about current moral issues. It's, it's the goggles, if you will. It's the filter from which you look out at life. Other questions are asked on this poll. Like, is living together outside of marriage acceptable? 62% without a biblical worldview said it was okay. Whereas only 2% that had a biblical worldview said it was okay. Major extreme. They were asked, is drunkenness acceptable? 36% without a biblical worldview said that, said that it was okay. So interesting, that's lower than you think. 
whereas only 2% with a biblical worldview said it was okay. They were asked, is viewing pornography acceptable behavior? 40% without a biblical worldview said it was okay. Whereas only 0.3 of a percent of those with a biblical worldview said it was okay. They were asked if homosexual behavior is acceptable. 31% without a biblical worldview said it was okay. Whereas only 2% with a biblical worldview said it was okay. Concerning abortion as a means of birth control. I can't even believe I said that. You know, I remember the first time I heard somebody say that they're practicing abortion based on gender. Oh, it's not a boy. Let's get rid of that one. I mean, I remember the first, I was just like, what? People can make that decision? So they were asked, this group was asked, concerning abortion as a means of just birth control. We didn't want a baby. Just, just kill it. Thirty-nine percent without a biblical worldview said it was okay. That's a lot. Whereas only 04 of a percent of people with a biblical worldview said it was okay. America's hurting, folks. Yes. A lot of confused people. But again, you see the need of having a biblical worldview, and you also understand why you feel like a minority. Because only 4% of people in America think like you do if you said yes to all eight questions. I debated whether or not to have you answer, uh, or to, to let me know if you answered yes to all eight questions. I answered yes to all eight questions. But only you really know if you believe that or not. But only 4% of Americans do. So that poses the question then, what do the 96% of the rest of Americans believe? If they don't have a biblical worldview, what do you have if you don't have a biblical worldview? Now there's seven other major categories here. I'll just give you three. The third most prominent worldview in America today is something called deism. And that is this belief that there is a God, but he has detached himself from us. It's like a watchmaker. He built the watch, he built the clock, he wound it up, but then he went to care for other important things. And he'll come back when it's time to manage us. Thomas Jefferson believed this. He was a deist. <laughs> and that's why I said earlier, do you believe there is a God that created everything and he still rules today? Because if you do, you're like one of the 4%. Because, and by the way... This affects my prayer life, does it not? If I actually believe he still rules today, and he's not an impersonal God that's gone off somewhere, then I will take my trials and my troubles and my heart's desires to him, because I actually believe he's listening like the word of God says. I'm the furthest thing from a deist, except to say, yes, I believe there is a God, and you, you, you talk to people and they say, oh, I believe there's a God, but then they're a deist. And so, whoa. That's the third most prominent worldview in America. The second most prominent belief or worldview in America today is humanism. Yes. Humanism. And that is, obviously, that there is no God. That this world is all there is. And because there is no God, then... Humans are the ones uh, to fix things. We're the ones maybe that have caused problems, and we're the only ones that can fix the problems. Interesting to know that Karl Marx was a humanist. Yeah. 
And so if you find yourself thinking, well, I don't know if there's a God, I don't know if uh, um, uh, he could fix anything anyway, I think I could. And you think the father of, of uh, communism, he felt that way too. Second most prominent worldview in America today. People not surrendering their thinking to the Bible. The most prominent worldview in America today is something called postmodernism. Postmodernism. And that's this idea where um, your God exists if you believe he exists. And your truth might be true for you, but it's maybe not necessarily true for me. But that's cool. That's all right. That's just fine. Number one worldview in America today is that let's just live and let live. You can't dogmatically say anything. Everyone's more intelligent than that. This is what we believe, and this is what they believe, and we only have a small, and you just hear, you know, every excuse in the book to justify that. I say we need some real Christians in America today that are truly surrendering their thinking, and truly thinking about their faith. And, of course, these are going to be serious Christians, who have developed a biblical worldview and not only say they believe what the Bible says, but they actually know what the Bible says and they actually use it as a filter to engage in the rest of the world to counsel and to share their faith with other people. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy Mind. Right. Surrender your thinking. You're not going to understand it all, but you could believe it all. You could surrender to believing it all. And just by doing that, yep. it'll affect your worldview. Amen. It'll affect the decisions that you make even as you leave this place today. Third question to help us analyze this today is what are the benefits then of a biblical worldview? What are the benefits of it? Or what does it mean to love the Lord thy God with all your mind? Let me say first and foremost that your mind is the control center of your life. Now in the Bible, the word heart means mind. It's the control center of your life. Many times when you see the word heart, it's it's talking about your mind. It's talking about the control center of your life, that which you uh, think of. It's not necessarily talking about the blood pumping organ in your chest. It's talking about your mind. Now, over 800 times in the Bible, the word heart is used. I told you this was going to be a bit of an information type message. But the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart... So is he. Well, then it really matters, doesn't it? If what I go around thinking about and what I surrender to think about determines who I end up being and, and what I stand for and the moral decisions that I make, I better make sure that I'm thinking on the right things. And just like we have computers today that need virus protection and malware protection and, and uh uh, all that other stuff because there's some evil genius out there that wants to write a program and just cause as much havoc on you as possible just for fun. Right. I better be careful with my mind because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. Why? Because out of it are the issues of life. And so I say it again, and I can't stress it too much. Surrender your thinking. 
develop a biblical worldview, look at that one question where you answered no, or those multiple questions where you answered no, and define that for yourself, and ask for faith in that area, and develop a biblical worldview. Why is that important? Because you're, you're guarding your mind. You're protecting your heart. You're stopping doubt from infiltrating your mind and your thinking, and it'll destroy you. You've heard the old adage. Is that how you say it? Adage. Adage. That sounds so much more <laughs> European. Let's go with that. <laughs> so a thought. Hey, let me, would you? So a thought. So a thought. Reap an act. So an act. Reap an app. A habit. So a habit. So a habit. Reap a character. So a character. Reap a destiny. You are what you think about. <laughs> Why is it so important we get in our Bibles every morning anyway? Oh, absolutely. Why is it so important that we find out what God says about a certain issue anyway? Why is it so important that we live by faith anyway? Because we are what we think about. <laughs> A biblical worldview is simply allowing God to control your thoughts. Or to put it another way, it's you and I thinking like Jesus. Yeah. You know, in Philippians where he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Think like I think. You surrender your thought pattern and your way of thinking or the way you've always thought about something to me and you take on my mind instead. Third question. What are the benefits then of a biblical worldview? What are the benefits of thinking like Jesus? Well, thinking like Jesus liberates from self-centered living. Notice in our memory verse for this week, Proverbs 3, 7, it says, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. But it starts with that little phrase, doesn't it? Be not wise in thine own eyes. Surrender your thinking. Start thinking like Jesus and be liberated from self-centered thinking. Now, when we all started life, we all started with self-centered thinking. I mean, when we wanted something, we cried for it. And if we really wanted it, it didn't matter how it inconvenienced anybody else. We cried about it, and we got our way. We got our diaper changed. We got food shoved in our face. We got a Band-Aid on our owie. We got the hug we needed, whatever it was. But can I say, that that is something for the children... But it's not for the mature Christian to continue on living this way. And if we would be not wise in our own eyes, we'd find ourselves liberated from this self-centered type of living where we understand, I can truly cast all my care upon him, for he careth for me. Yep. That's the way I think about it now. By, by the way, it's a great revelation in life to think there is a God, and I'm not Him. Amen. And He'll take care of it. And it's not for me to get involved in everything. It's not for me to worry about everything. No, when I develop a biblical world view, I start to realize that God is the center of the universe, not me. So I'm no longer wise in my own eyes. I'm taking on the character, the nature, the mind of God. And I'm looking at things this way now. I'm thinking about this more now. Uh, second benefit or positive benefit of thinking like Jesus is thinking like Jesus concentrates on knowing and loving God. <laughs> Not before, but it does now. Notice here he says... Be not wise in thine own eyes. Notice the, sec the middle phrase here. Fear the Lord. 
Okay, I'm going to surrender my thinking to him, and now I'm going to fear the Lord. You know, a biblical worldview doesn't teach that God is harsh and unkind. It teaches that he's a God that loves us. He's a God that cares about us. And Jesus taught this when, when he walked on earth. He lived the type of life where it says in Mark 135, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. He was seeming to always be aware of the presence of his father. And he carried on a living, loving relationship with his father. That's a positive benefit, amen, of having a biblical worldview. You think of how he must have been shocked when he walked among us and the decisions that he had to make. And looking at us, just thinking of ourselves all the time and him having to teach and train and work with the Pharisees. You think of how liberated people were from their, their own ideals and their own selves as they began to understand who he was and how there is a bigger picture going on. Think of how the disciples must have felt as they started this journey of concentrating their thoughts and their life on knowing and loving God. You realize that that godly type love is not a sissy type love? Sometimes there's big, tough, macho men that think I could never be a Christian because that's maybe a sissy type of love. I would implore you to watch The Passion of Christ if you at all think that way. And watch a very tough, very masculine, uh, a very, very uh, strong man endure unthinkable torture headed to that cross and hanging on that cross. And the more you think on knowing a God like that, I think the more you'll love a God like that. Right? You see... Having a biblical worldview, it focuses in on knowing Him. And you fall in love with Him. That's a positive benefit. Totally replaces you on the throne with Him. A third positive thing of having a biblical worldview and thinking like Jesus is it designates healthy moral boundaries. And this is what we need so bad in America today. Proverbs 3.7 be not wise in thine own eyes. Be liberated from that. Fear the Lord. Get concentrating on knowing and loving Him. Depart from evil. And then if you read verse 8 as well, it goes perfectly with it. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. It's a positive aspect of surrendering your thinking to think like Jesus, to filter everything through the Word of God. All of a sudden, you have healthy moral boundaries. Now, you have, you have places you will not cross over. There's a whole bunch of other worldviews out there, but they don't have these absolute standards of right and wrong. Postmodernism, uh, uh, the one we battle most in America today... They don't have this. Every morality out there, it's all relative. They think if it's wrong for you, then it's not necessarily wrong for you. But a biblical worldview demands there's an absolute right and there's an absolute wrong. This is it. This is what we believe. Do you believe that? After September 11th, 2001, our president stood up and he addressed the nation. And he said, we have looked into the face of evil. Remember that? How could he say that? The Bible teaches murder is wrong. We have an absolute. He had that biblical worldview. He had that framework uh, uh, to, to work on. Write this down if you would. The only morality that works is a morality based upon absolute standards. That's the only one that works. That's why it's so important that our government stick to the principles of the founding fathers. 
Postmodernism doesn't say that, though. What they're trying to bring in isn't the same. What they're teaching the children in the schools isn't the same. They try to teach that there's many moral standards. There's many different types of moral beliefs, and it's based on culture. No. No. No, that's not right. It's not right at all. Because then you would have to say that the people that flew the planes on September 11th into the trade towers were really heroes. That's right. That's culture. Because their culture said that. Their ideology pushes that. They just want to right in their own eyes. There's no moral absolute there that says this is, this is wrong. Murder is wrong. You'd have to say the same thing about the Nazis and what they did because they had a culture of this is right, and this is wrong, and they're wrong, and they need to be eliminated. Right. And this is where everybody's good. So it won't work. We need a standard yes. of absolute right and wrong. And ladies and gentlemen, the standard is the Bible. Yes, right. it's the only one we got. It's it. It's it. We must filter everything through it. Watch the news and think of the Bible. Have a conversation and think of the Bible. Leave here today thinking of the Bible. And can I say, think of those eight things and I'll, I'll list them again. Live a life where you believe moral truths exist. Uh, uh, have, have the Bible define absolute truths for you. Believe deep down in yourself that Jesus really did live a, sin, a sinless life. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, believe that God is the all-powerful creator. And he still does rule over his creation today. Believe that salvation is a gift from God. And it cannot be earned. And there's nothing we can do uh, for it. Believe that there is a real living devil and he walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour um, believe deep down inside yourself and let it affect you that a Christian does have the responsibility to get out and share their faith Amen. with others yes. uh, why because it's part of your biblical world view right. because God says to believe the Bible is accurate in all its teachings and the next time you go to it at devotion time, you'll go to it with less doubt yes. and more faith. And he can just speak candidly to you. America doesn't need more grilled cheese Christians. No. We don't need more melted M&M Christians. No, what we need is to surrender our thinking to God. And the greatest example of the power of surrender was Jesus himself. Yeah. John chapter 10 and verse 17, he said this, Therefore did my father love me. This is interesting. He said it. Yeah. Yeah. Therefore did my father love me. Because I laid down my life. You see the surrender? Yeah. That's why he loves it. That's what he said. I'm not saying he's not going to love you if you don't lay down your life. But that's what Jesus said. Therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. He gives us a free will. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, he says, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. This is the father's will and I'm just doing it. What a great example of surrender. As he hung on the cross in Luke chapter 23 and verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Surrender. Even surrendering his spirit. Are you willing to surrender your thinking to the one that made you? And to the one that rules today and to the one that you will meet someday are you willing to say something to him like today I surrender my doubts my fear 
my future, my will, my thinking. Today I surrender my spirit, my life to you, Lord. Would that be you today? Live a life of complete surrender. Would you stand with me today with your head bowed and your eyes closed? I wonder if God spoke to your heart about something today and today you would surrender it. I wonder if you thought today, you know, if he is real and if he is right and if he is ruling, then I'm in a whole heap of trouble and you want to get surrendered today. Now's the time to do it.